introduce uh, the two presenters today. And I think Audrey is going to bring up the first slides. So our two presenters today are Michel Parent, who did his PhD in Western Ontario with Alexi Drymanis in 1987. And he's a research scientist with the Geological Survey of Canada, where he's worked since 1988. He is located in the Research Centre in Quebec City. His research interests cover the Quaternary Stratigraphy and events of southeastern Canada, the late Quaternary ice dynamics and ice flow patterns in Nunavik, prominence and composition of glacial sediments, mineral exploration research in glacial terrains, and late Quaternary sea level change. Michel Lamont is from the University of Quebec in Montreal, also did his PhD with, in Western Ontario with Alexi John Manis in 1985 concerning the strategic and chronology of southern Quebec, which is a subject of this field trip. And he worked at the Geological Survey of Canada in 1985 to 87, applying new mineral exploration techniques in glaciated terrains of New Brunswick. Michel has been a professor at the University of Quebec in Montreal since 1987. And his work involves quaternary geology and geomorphology and research into the development of luminescence dating. Now we have time scheduled for questions throughout the field trip and to ask a question please use the chat box or share your video to alert the leaders that you have a question. And there will also be more time at the end where we'll ask, answer as many questions as possible. So with that let's begin the field trip and I'll turn the webinar over to our first speaker Michelle Parent and um, we'll go from there. Take it away, Michelle. Okay. Uh, I'll put it on the. How do I get this to be a presentation? Is that all I'm off? I have so many things on my desktop now. <laughs> En haut. En haut, tu vas voir diaporama. Là? Non, 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 à droite, là, c'est marqué, là. Si c'est marqué, euh, c'est ça. Diaporama, tu vas passer par dessus. Juste là. Okay. Clique. Pas tant à gauche. Et tu parles là. Ouais. À partir du début, c'est ça? Oui. That's because the, uh, the go to meeting oh, right. is the, the low, lower part of the screen. So the... OK, vas-y. OK, so uh, I hope everybody can see properly. Uh, so, uh, I think Julie has put the question correctly. How much ice in southern Quebec and adjacent New England? This is, these are the questions that we will be discussing today on, on the basis of the stratigraphic record that we've observed over, over the last 20, 30 years. Okay, so this... Michelle, uh, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. It's Audrey. If Perfect. I was going to say we could still see your go-to meeting uh, sidebar but i think it looks okay now maybe if you could make it a little bigger that would be great yeah. uh that's i'm pretty well full screen here okay perfect thank you okay. so uh, the uh <clears throat> the st lawrence valley uh you can see the area of interest uh, by the big dot there uh is some distance uh several hundred kilometers at least from the outer ice margin uh, and it's a it's a fairly large area uh, in which uh, set quaternary sections are exposed not all that commonly. Uh, the St. Lawrence Valley is, as you can see on this DM, is an area that lies essentially uh, the, the the thick black line around the uh, DM. In the middle of the DM is the St. Lawrence Valley, of course, and it's largely below 200 meters. And actually, uh, once you get down to 150 meters or so above sea level, uh, it's a fairly flattish area. The 200 meter limit is close to the limit of the Champlain Sea, especially on the northern, uh, on the nor at the north at the edge of the shield uh, or the Laurentian Highlands. Uh, but in in the on the Appalachian side, uh, 
the marine limit is somewhat lower and it's more on the order of 150 meters. This is a, a, a map that we, we prepared recently on the elevation of the bedrock surface. It does show that, uh, the, first of all, the, the true lowland, the, the, the St. Lawrence platform, actually lies pretty well at zero or below uh, or below. So essentially, it's that triangular part centered uh, with the apex around Lake St. Pierre. That's pretty well the edge of uh, <clears throat> the St. Lawrence lowlands. The Piedmont on, on the right hand side, I don't know if you can see, uh, you cannot see my cursor, okay. Uh, on yeah, the right hand side is actually the, the Piedmont. Uh, and there's also an, 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 a, a Laurentian Piedmont that lies at, in the green colors on the northern side of the valley. So essentially, it's, it's geologically complex, as we saw in, uh, as we can see in this slide. And it has, uh, you can recognize a bit of the drainage network, particularly in the areas where this uh, digital elevate, this uh, elevation model is well controlled that is in the southern part uh, below Lake St. Pierre, which is right at the center of the region, if you want. You get, you guys will have a recognize, I, I suppose, um, uh, Lake St. Pierre, the Quebec City at the far east end, and, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, Montreal Island area. The total thickness of quaternary sediments is uh, this is a map that we pr we produced recently, but as you can see, there are three three large three sizable areas where uh, quaternary sediments are relatively thick in the Saint Lawrence Valley. There is the the uh, from uh, from northeast to southwest. There is the Trois Rivières area just near on the north shore of Lake Saint Pierre. There is the Richelieu. There's a fairly large area in the Richelieu uh, Yamaska Valley. And there's also uh, <coughs> a thick area in Eastern Ontario of a uh, thicker area of quaternary sediments. However, in, in the three cases, uh, in those three areas, the uh, quaternary record is somewhat different. Uh, for instance, in the <coughs> In the Ottawa area, in the Ottawa Valley area to the west, uh, it's largely uh, a marine clay, a thick marine clay sequence that is exposed. It's also uh, the case, uh, there's a fairly large, th uh, fairly thick uh, marine clay area uh, at the north end of, uh, of uh, the study of the north end near Lake St. Pierre. And also north of, or northwest of Lac, uh, north sorry of Lac Saint Pierre. So, and in the in those cases, uh, it is uh, sediments. That, in that latter case, it was sediment supplied by the Saint Maurice River. The next slide shows uh, <laughs> the thickness, the total thickness of quaternary sediments below Champlain Sea sediments. And these highlights the, the, the basins that were well known previously, as well as the new ones. Uh, for instance, uh, the Trois Rivières area, uh, north of Lac Saint Pierre, northeast of Lac Saint Pierre, is a fairly well known area for thick uh, uh, pre-LGM sediments, if you want. It is also the area that Michel will be talking about around Pierreville, but it's a fairly small area and it's uh, somewhat fragmented. In the Richelieu River area, and that's too bad that I can't find this tool here, but anyway, in the Richelieu River area, just east of Montreal, uh, there's also a, a fair, an area, fairly large area, of fairly thick uh, pre-LGM sediments. And uh, <coughs> that that is relatively new. We, did, we weren't aware before we conducted the study uh, <clears throat> towards um, uh, east of Montreal, we were not aware of this. 
And as you can see in the Ottawa Valley area, there's not a great deal of thickness of uh, till and and uh, other sediments. It's so as I said earlier, it's mo it's mostly mostly consists of uh, marine clay and till actually not. So Michelle, when, uh, Michelle Parent, it's Audrey again. Sorry to interrupt. We're yeah. we're some people are really struggling to see um, all your research. So let's have you stop screen sharing and try try to kind of reset and see if we can see your whole screen because we see your next slide on the right side. So maybe if you just want to stop screen sharing and try to kind of redo it again. Sorry to totally okay. interrupt you. Okay. How do I stop screen sharing? Okay, I end the, the slide pr presentation. Mm -hmm. okay. Stop the, Sorry, okay. everybody, I just want to make sure that we can all well, see. Okay, this, so you want me to, uh, okay. So on the uh, top left. To start again. The, yep, press the little sorry. top left. Uh, Michelle Lamuth, maybe you can help him. Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, that's the one when you start from the start. But yeah, can but you see now? And then you see always a, a sort of a, a screen that is made up of your actual slide, and on the right, the the next slide. So we lost, the, we're losing details in your side. We don't see really well the slide. We should oh, see no. full screen. But I think it's a go to meeting. Uh, there's something about that i don't know when i show you my screen uh, audrey did you see the whole screen i saw the whole screen i wonder if this little kind of projector maybe, yeah, maybe it's the 16 the okay i'll end the slide i'll uh yeah. Yeah. I stop the slideshow okay and i'll go back to the meeting settings uh, okay so hello michelle thomas. michelle it's thomas I don't know if you can see, but under monitor automatic, you have utilize the mode presentator. Just uh, un, uh, uncheck this, this stuff. See who's on? Uh, on the right side of the panel, like, you uh, said, you have all the options, you see, at the beginning, at the beginning of the diapositive, you go to the right and you have monitor automatic. And just on the monitor automatic, you have utilized the mode presentator. And then you decoche that. Ah oui, oui, oui. C'est bon, c'est ça. On va essayer. Okay. Prêt, ça, Michel. Merci, Thomas. Bonne présentation. OK. Now, ah, thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for helping. I, I can't read their, their French, so I do apologize. So everybody, this should be good. Sorry for the interruption. You can continue now. Thank you. OK. I'll move back to uh, slide uh, number uh, where I was. Okay. So uh, how do I get rid of this panel of go to? Okay. And Michel, we so, see your, on, on voit ta, ta souris, donc tu peux l'utiliser pour montrer des choses. Oh, I couldn't do that a while ago. Okay. No, no, you, you, you could, but. Uh, okay. I, I couldn't see it anyway. All right. So uh, when uh, Michel and I soon after, not, not too long after we finished our, our thesis, uh, presented the uh, synthesis paper on the Quaternary Stratigraphy of, of Southern Quebec. <coughs> and essentially, uh, we couldn't quite be sure whether to favor hypothesis A or hypothesis B. So this is a, a figure that, I've, that we've redrawn from this old paper. And as you can see, uh, in in one case, uh, in the hypothesis A, the Gentilly till or the last glacial advent in the in, in the valley uh, is equivalent to a single till in the Appalachians. And uh, below the Gentilly till and the Knoxville till, there was uh, a possible uh, deglaciation across the, the valley in, and into the Laurentian Highlands during the during stage three. Can uh, I intervene here, Michel? Pardon? May I intervene? Yes. <clears throat> because there are students at uh, UMass, I think, and other people who don't really know the stratigraphy. Uh, 
what we see here are, are two, two boxes. Uh, one is hypothesis A, the other one is hypothesis B. If you only look at uh, hypothesis A, this is a move, let's say that it's enough for the argument right now. We have split the areas, Laurentian Highland, there's only basically one till. This is what you see, the surf, surf, surface till, which is called the Gen CD till, mostly. And you go in the central St. Lawrence lowland, uh, years of investigation tells us that we have three glacial advance over the last uh, glacial, interglacial, glacial cycle. So at the bottom, we have a very old till, Illinoisan till, we think, of age. Uh, Becanco, that's the name in the central St. Lawrence. In the Appalachian, we think it's the same one as the Johnville till. Uh, in the um, Central St. Lawrence, we have another till called Lévra till, and we think it's of the same age as the Chaudière till on the right hand side in the Appalachian. And then we have at the top the surface till, which is the Gen CD till in the Central St. Lawrence lowland, and the Lennoxville till in the Appalachian. The whole discussion has been over the years was uh, at some point. Uh, the, the whole area deglaciated during MIS-3. So there was there a break in the succession in the Appalachian and the Central St. Lawrence lowland. And uh, so we built up two hypotheses. There was a break, so that's hypothesis A, and there was no break, and that's a hypothesis B. And uh, we'll see basically the argument of the field trip is how we can tell from the sections and from the dating that maybe, maybe I can already scoop uh, myself and Michelle, that it's probably hypothesis B, uh, hypothesis A, I'm sorry. That uh, it, it has to be open during the mid Wisconsin. But uh, it's really based here on the, what we call that a time space diagram. So it's based on superposition of till and non glacial deposit and co correlation between areas. Okay, Michelle, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was help. that was helpful thank you so essentially this is our the heart however after we we had made uh, that contribution uh sorry why doesn't it continue my button doesn't want to turn what's happened to the next slide oh okay sorry after we uh, made this 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 contribution there was the discovery of a new marine unit under uh, overlying Leverard Till. It's called the La Perade Clay, and it underlies the St. Pierre sediments. Uh, the St. Pierre sediment is a, is a very, it's a fairly widespread unit in, in the valley, and it's very much a marker bed. And overlying this was, of course, the, uh, <coughs> the Gentilly Till. Of course, this uh, this interpretation seems this diagram seems to favor uh, hypothesis B. That is, the Gentilly till would represent uh, much of the uh, isotope stages two, three, and four. So essentially, uh, and the Champlain Sea is at the very top, just before 10,000 BP. These are old radiocarbon. These are not calibrated. Uh, radiocarbon ages. So that was the reconstruction that was made uh, at the time by Okietzi. Uh, <coughs> okay, the question now is uh, with, the, with the discovery of the new marine unit in the uh, in the Richelieu area, uh, how, how do we uh, how do we <coughs> reconstruct this uh, and how do we reassess this in terms of uh, the middle Wisconsin events in the St. Lawrence Valley? So we need, essentially this discovery leads us to, into the need of uh, reassessing the regional succession. Uh, are the new radiocarbon ages valid? And are they consistent uh, with IRSL and OSL ages? So essentially this is what this field trip will be about. So we will be presenting uh, successively uh, the, the, the two areas. 
as you as as I'm perhaps not stated enough uh, okay uh, <coughs> this is extremely important in, in terms of isonium and interest in this question has been kind of rekindled if you want by geophysical geophysical modeling that suggests that uh, relative sea level in the Atlantic coastal plain was fairly high at 40 uh, 40k so as you can see on the right on the right hand panel uh, in the mid-atlantic bight uh, south uh, in Carolina Carolina and and uh, I forgot the name of the place but uh, Virginia uh, and South Virginia, Virginia yes sorry yeah. Virginia and Carolina uh, relative sea level was fairly high at minus three uh, global sea level, however, at that time was uh, fairly low at minus 40 meters. So uh, this is the question, and in order to accommodate, uh, and this, in order to ac accommodate this information uh, of high sea level during MIS-3, MIS uh, Pico uh, and, and her co-authors imagine uh, that uh, modeled that uh, ice volume was uh, was extension was much reduced during uh, MIS three, and it essentially a, a great deal of eastern Canada was uh, not covered by ice, and uh, as opposed to the previous meeting, which is the Peltier meeting in the middle panel, uh, which had had ice but add a lot of ice across uh, across the Laurentide ice sheet, if you want, at uh, 44 Ka. So two different, very different models. However, ice uh, 6G has since, uh, let's say, modified the, the, the Peltier model, uh, has modified its, its view recently, but essentially it shows the, uh, so the question, of course, is how much ice in in uh, in the Quebec Labrador sector of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, this is another view of the more or less the same picture. It, it shows it in in more uh, detail. Are the are there any are there any questions at this point, or comments or anybody raising a no. I just put a, this is Audrey, I just put a message. If anybody has a question along the way, type it in the chat box or you can share your camera to alert us that you would like to chat. So thank you. Okay. So essentially I can continue if you want. Nobody is. So essentially the, uh, uh, the, the problem has been of uh, how to interpret the Southern Quebec stratigraphy. In part, and it's the case of many other areas, but essentially uh, the two, the two quick, uh, key questions is how we can uh, identify whether uh, drainage was blocked or, 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 or free in the Appalachians and the St. Lawrence Valley. So essentially it's, it's the main means means that we have to reflect on the how uh, the LIS, the Laurentide Ice Sheet is constructed. So on one hand, we have uh, about a great proglacial lake that are that are important to with respect to uh, ice volume and extent during growth and retreat of the ice sheet. And uh, the, the next point will be that let's see uh, what lessons we have learned from uh, the development of Glacial Lake Candona and uh, a few a few of its key features, uh, the Alverton Tingwick Moraine, which is almost located at the far in, far end of the uh, at the uh, let's say uh, latest uh, phase of Lake Candona. And as well as the Elliot Hill Game Delta. So essentially, in, in, in the Lake Kendo and the story, 
we, we can relate um, the events to uh, the uh, we can relate the events to link ice sheet margins and lake levels uh, quite closely. So the Alverton thing with Moraine that I was talking about is here. The uh, the Elliott Hill uh, came, Delta came is here. And uh, these are the various moraines uh, from the Appalachians in the Appalachian area. So essentially, we now know that uh, this, the, the limit, let's say the northern limit of Lake Canada, and I would, uh, at the time that I proposed it uh, 30 years ago or more, uh, the northern end of it consisted of uh, that I could trace it at the time was the north end of Eskers uh, in the St. Lawrence Valley. Uh, north of that, there are very few, if if no uh, Esker known. I know I now know that uh, this boundary, the uh, shown as uh, 11, 1100 and uh, sorry, eleven thousand and one hundred years, uh, is somewhat further north. And that showed on this limit, and actually, it's probably more uh, in this vicinity, northwest of Montreal, and extends all the way across here. So a lot of the, uh, for instance, North Saint Hilaire area was also covered by Lake Candona. Uh, this shows um, the reconstructed water level in in the southern Saint Lawrence lowland. Uh, in the area, the area that had worked, that I had compiled at the time, essentially uh, <coughs> several sites were known for VARVs. For instance, the Melbourne site, the uh, Laundry River site, and the Saint Cesar site, uh, which is here, in which there aren't not many VARVs. Essentially, in in those three localities, there are well, fairly well documented uh, <coughs> VARV sections associated with Lake Kandua. And the level of the lake is just at the northeast end, uh, the related, related level uh, uh, at, the, at, uh, at the, which links the ice margin to the position is this uh, feature here, which is an ice contact delta uh, uh, near Elliott Hill. So if we uh, move to the next slide, and after Lake Candona, lake levels or water levels in the St. Lawrence Valley fell by about 50 meters to the upper level of the Champlain Sea. Of course, uh, Today, we, we now have um, uh, many LIDAR models, which make it a lot easier to locate uh, strand line levels. Uh, but at the time, that it was a fairly tedious work to investigate air photos, uh, go with altimeter surveys and all, and all that stuff. So essentially, we have a 50 meters drop, uh, drop of sea level between the two features. And uh, at, the, at the southern end, of course, uh, we had no idea beyond, let's say, into the Montreal area, which we now believe was part of the of the Lake Candona episode. We don't we don't have any idea of actually what the lake lake level was at the time of Lake uh, Candona in Montreal. Area. So this is uh, a typical example of an esker fed. Subaquia Southwash that that had degraded uh, up to the level. They were actually there was unfortunately it's a bit shady here, but in, in the shade up uh, at the top of the hill, you can see uh, top set beds, which uh, we had interpreted, I had interpreted as marking uh, the level of Lake Candona at uh, 226 meters. Marine limit in that area is about 165. Uh, just this is one of the nice bluffs uh, that I had uh, found near Darling. Darling is near Valcour. For, that's where they make uh, the snowmobiles. If you if you like, it's on the Appalachian uh, 
It's on the Appalachian Piedmont, uh, more or less in the middle of the uh, <coughs> Lake Candona area. It's a very nice bluff that was. Uh, now, if we, I've never much shared those photos of uh, the of Lake Kendall and of Arves, uh, or the Danville, which, which I had called uh, Danville, Danville Varves. But the upper 50 meters, uh, the upper 50 Varves, sorry, are more or less uh, one to two centimeters thick. There is a Varve diagram in the 1999 paper, uh, essentially. So this is the, the, the top most, uh, almost top most Varves of the uh, Danville Varves. And as perhaps you can distinguish that there are actual fossil traces in the summer beds. Sorry, oops. And this is in, in Varv 26. Uh, and uh, in Varv 26, I, at the time I was wondering what these were, but it's, uh, I believe now that uh, it, I thought for a while that it was Candona, but that was uh, Candona subtriangulata that was uh, responsible for those trace fossils, but it's not. It's much too large for Candona. Uh, Candona is a very uh, only uh, 60, 70, cent, 70 centi uh, millimeters in, in size, so this is much bigger. Cannot do this. So it's I believe it's a it's a shrimp like. Uh, a small feature that is typical of glacial uh, glacial lakes in eastern North America, and actually, I believe that whenever we see uh, uh, glacial lake varves, at least those that dark mark deglaciation, you will find these trace fossils. These trace fossils occur all along, and in some places, especially in the uh, far end uh, at the at the upper end, sorry, of the varves. Uh, these are very characteristic. And this is the transition. So essentially, at the bottom, you can see uh, a couple of varves here, okay? And then the total disruption of the sedimentation pattern and over about, uh, let's say, uh, 10 centimeters, uh, strat it's well stratified unit and it, and then, immediately into Champlain Sea Clay. So this is the transitional area between the, uh, the two sets of, uh, of uh, clays, if you want, uh, the laminated clays of, uh, or the, uh, the varves, uh, the Denver varves and the Champlain Sea Clay. So this is the, the main, er one of the only area actually uh, sites where uh, the, the transition uh, was observed between Lake Candona and Champlain Sea Clay. Uh, of course, uh, there are also uh, the folks in uh, the Champlain Valley have uh, cored many areas where they record similar features. Now, uh, this is the, the, uh, the locality of uh, the varve that I had shown you is right there be, beside the red point and Elliot Hill is right there. So. Michelle, you, you have a question from then. Okay, I uh, can take it if you want. Someone yes. is asking, how are, are you sure one is ocean and one is lake? Is oh, by the fossil content. I'm sorry, I assumed that the, uh, people were aware of, of the paper and, and uh, the fossil content is extremely different. It was the, the the two clays were physically very different. The glacial lacustrine clay for in the field was relatively firm and stiff, whereas the marine clay is extremely soft. Uh, so there was already a physical difference. We tried to look at the at the provenance. Uh, we 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 had done a, a whole lot of uh, uh, X-ray. Uh, sorry, not X-ray, but. Uh, Diffract, X-ray diffraction uh, diagrams, and essentially it's the same the same clay material. It's the provenance is essentially the same between the clays, but the physical aspect is very different. And uh, uh, we looked at the fossil content of the, the two clays, 
and the Danville wires contain only uh, Candona subtriangulata. If you want, to, uh, whereas the marine clay contains uh, no trace fossils, and those fo uh, those fossils that make those traces that I would uh, sorry that I was showing to you a while ago completely disappear in the marine clay, and what we find in the marine clay are a series of uh, classical uh, forearms and ostracods of the Champlain Sea. Actually, uh, Guy Bilodeau uh, actually uh, did his, uh, his bat bachelor's thesis on this uh, before going to ECAM to continue his, his formation as a paleoecologist. Okay, that answer the question? Okay, so if we go into the into the Appalachians, uh, the, the key question has been uh, the extent and record of glacial lake gears. So uh, Bill Schultz, whom I'm sure we all know quite well, uh, that was his reconstruction a while, uh, a while ago. That was the classical rec reconstructions, essentially showing uh, glacial leg gears as the lower level at uh, 200 or so and 80 meters uh, with outlets towards the northeast at the uh, east of the Chaudier Valley. And uh, sorry, the chat box is in the way. I'll put it over there. In the uh, Chaudier Valley, the upper Chaudier Valley, the Lake Bigantic area, uh, the uh, outlets were at uh, 425, 29 meters, sorry. And this is the classical upper phase of uh, glacial lake gears. However, uh, research over the years has shown us this was the site of the Ascot River section, but it's not the type section for the uh, for the lake, lake gears clay, the, uh, the, gears, the lake gears uh, uh, site is at uh, the gears dam. So essentially, this is the reconstruction. And in order to, uh, what I will uh, show you, in order to, to have such a high level, you need to block all the valleys uh, in the Lake Champlain Valley. And even then, you don't, you can't even know this. So I've mapped, uh, I've, on this map, I've put in the, the lowest calls in the uh, in the Vermont region. So, uh, and uh, of course in Quebec. So anytime that ice goes beyond uh, these points, uh, recedes beyond these points, lake level has to fall uh, much below 380 meters. However, how much uh, below is a good question. Now, the Gares formation in, in various areas as a very is very distinctive from the lake glacial clays. It's it's a it consists largely of glacial proximal glacial lacustrine turbidites. This is a typ typical example of one of the first sections that I ever investigated in the Appalachians, the Willowbrook section. And it's also beyond the limit of uh, what, uh, uh, beyond the limit of recession <coughs> of the Gaius formation. A classical example of sections in the uh, in the Appalachians involving uh, the Gaius formation is the uh, Upper Lennoxville Till, which has a typical shield provenance, mind you. There are only a few uh, Precambrian clasts, whereas the Chaudière till uh, below it, uh, below the, the, the Garris formation, of course, has no PC class. So it, essentially, it's a very effective way of uh, distinguishing uh, one tills from the next because this one, the Chaudière till, sometimes outcrops at the surface. This is another uh, at that. This is uh, from from that site. Here is another view of the uh, proximal glacial lacustrine turbidites of uh, the Gaius formation. These are very common 
and it's like that over it's these, these are the facies that you find for the gaze formation over a large area uh, of terrain so essentially uh, these are the sites that I was uh, referring to what does it mean okay these are the sites that I was referring to. I will show you two additional sites that within the area of Lake Gears that show that uh, Lake Gears Lake level had fallen well below the 380 meters. If the first one is the Scotch Road section that, of, of course, I didn't have the opportunity to reinvestigate a whole lot because. Uh, the next time I went over to the section after discovering and making a few and few till fabrics in there, uh, the uh, <coughs> it had been bull bulldozed in order for road repair. So essentially, again, you have the upper Lennoxville till with its characteristic northwest provenance indicators that is uh, ultramafic class and Precambrian class. And below it is an oxidized zone uh, for uh, the Chaudière till. And Chaudière till at that locality has essentially Appalachian class and provenance. So this weak oxidized, weakly oxidized horizon indicates it's, and it's only, uh, I'll show you the section after, sorry. And this is what it looks like in the, it looked like in the field from my, from my notes essentially at, Atop, yeah, on top you have the, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, oh, there's an animation in there. Okay, there's the glacial, uh, glacial lake name from Agog sediments, the Lennoxville till, which has uh, striae and composition indicating uh, northwest provenance and classical. And the lower, the darker green till is the Chaudière till. And it has uh, provenance indicators uh, that are, or compositional indicators that are very different from, from the overlying Benigville Hotel. So essentially we have uh, an oxidized zone at the top of, uh, of Chaudier Till. At the time that I discovered, this is the only, why do I, why I want it to turn, I'm supposed to turn over to the next slide. Okay, sorry. Why is it? It's very slow. Uh, okay. The next site is what the Saint Romain site, which I discovered uh, quite a few years uh, after my PhD. But it's located about uh, down about one kilometer down glacier from an intrusion of distinctive gray granite. And this distinctive gray granite shows us that the upper till here, uh, <laughs> sorry, is a typical Lennoxville till. It has a sharp basal contact and the subaerial sediments, the, the sediments that underlie Lennoxville are, are subaerial outwash sand gravel that have that uh, are marked by pedal currents towards the northwest, which means that at this locality, uh, it was at least uh, the, the lake level had fallen. And uh, so the, the putative uh, lower level uh, of 381 meters does not stand uh, following this. So this is the typical Stansted gray granite, uh, and a, an example of it. So it, it's easily found. It's, a, it's actually it's the same granite as in the, that of, in Northern Vermont. For those, uh, so, so it's the, uh, I forgot the age. Okay. And with this, uh, I'll leave you with a nice tail wedge that was uh, in place at the base of, uh, of the Lennoxville till at that locality, it dips towards the southeast. So it's a, it's a classical uh, example of till wedges. And I believe this completes this part of my presentation. Why won't it change? I thought there was a 
questions right next no? uh, okay sorry okay so as uh, michelle said a little while earlier uh we now favor hypothesis hypothesis a for long um, so there was a, a period of free dent drainage in the appalachians during the Shadier Lennoxville interval. And uh, so <clears throat> uh, the period of uh, ice cover in the St. Lawrence Valley uh, was consequently probably much less uh, continuous and long than we had. So we kind of favor what we could call now the short chrono chronology in the Appalachians from the, the record of the uh, Gears Formation in the Appalachians. Yes. So do we have any questions, any further questions or comments? I think um, Michelle Gauthier had a question. Yes, go, re go ahead, Michelle. Um, yeah, well, as you know, I, the whole lake to ocean debate is a big question in Manitoba too. And don't hear you sorry oh. speak a little louder sorry yes this computer doesn't work very well i was just wondering what lab you send your samples to for what? paleoecology what 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 lab do you send the samples to for uh pale oh. paleoecology at, at at the time for paleoecology it was actually uh you mean for lake candona for instance yeah, about the section that we're describing in Den Vins. That's the yes, section. that's that is Guy Bilodeau that had done that. And he's no longer in the field, I think. Works at Laval University in the library after completing his PhD. But uh, otherwise, uh, of course, uh, we now, and as you will see in, in the next uh, present, in the next stop there, in the, Next leg in a in a in, in a following leg of the field trip. Uh, now it's uh, Jean Pierre Guilbeau. And that he is that. attending. He's attending the the field trip. He's attending the meeting. So uh, you may oh, of right. course ask questions uh, to him uh, in the next phase of of the field trip. Sorry, for, sorry, guys. It does show that I don't speak English all that often anymore, right? <laughs> sorry, I'm searching for words. <laughs> I think that Jean Pierre wants to say a word, uh, Julie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to ask if I, if, I'm, uh, if I there's a question for me. I know, I don't follow clearly uh, what you see. Now, the Michel Gauthier was asking if you, uh, who, uh, what was the lab where Michel Parent sent his sample? So he mentioned the name of uh, someone who did a master, who is not doing that anymore. And we, we, we said that we now send the samples to you. And uh, so maybe someone, if someone wants to take contact with you, your name is Jean Pierre Guilbeault. Yes. And you're, uh, you can say what you do very, very briefly because we need to go on. But uh... oh, what I'm doing and nowadays, I do nothing anymore because I'm I'm retired. But uh, until uh, well, uh, until uh, very, very recently, I was doing uh, work for uh, Michel Parin, and that was a uh, foraminifera, and occasionally some astrocasts that come with them. But uh, really, uh, it's uh, very uh, it's, uh, that's because it's just a very quick look. I don't really know them. But uh, if you have marine material, uh, yes, I could, uh, in an emergency, uh, look at the, <laughs> still have a look at the, uh, at, uh, at uh, marine samples for five minutes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. okay, well, I think we should move on. And we do hope that someday the Canadians will let the Americans back in and we'll let you practice your English a little more. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you very much for your presentation, Michelle.
Now we're going to hand it off to Michelle Lamont. Take it away, Michelle. Okay, thank you. Now I, I still see the screen of uh, Michelle Parent. How do I how do I do this to uh, you remove your screen? Um, and uh, it's Audrey okay. here, uh, Michelle. Uh, Lamont, you can just you can just start screen sharing too, since you're both okay. organizers. Okay, so uh, so what I'm going to start there. And then there there was one more question in there from Hazel Gordon saying, you know, I don't know if you guys touched on that. Oh no, I did not see that. Oh, yeah, there are seven. Uh, okay. Ah, uh, oh, it was a question. Michelle is for Michelle Parent. Hazel Gordon asked, in this area, what are the processes that create a till wedge? I believe uh, it's uh, it's freeze and thaw, uh, freeze and, and thaw successive episodes at the base of the ice. I forgot to mention that in the till wedge that you saw there, uh, there was no immediately adjacent uh, glacial lacustrine sediments, but in the wedge, I don't know if you saw, there were plenty of clasts, uh, and I think I can even back up. I don't have I have more. Um, oh yeah, okay. In in that till wedge, I, these are actually uh, uh, <coughs> intraclasts of uh, glacial lacustrine sediments with, that were probably derived from uh, <laughs> nearby glacial lakes. So essentially, it's kind of oscillations between freeze and thaw. This this sub-horizontal uh, thrust plane that is that appears in this photo uh, extended over a period, uh, sorry, a, a length of about uh, 10, 10 meters at the most. So essentially, the there are areas that freeze at, at times below the ice, and that uh, re-entrains uh, some of the glacial substrate. Actually, the uh, and this might mention while while I'm at it, uh, in the in the townships, uh, in the in the Appalachians of southern Quebec, I found at least uh, four or five sites of such till wedges, plus the one that was described by Dion and Schultz uh, way back in the uh, in the seventies or something like that. Okay, Sorry, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll remove my presentation there. I think you should uh, stop uh, sharing. I don't know if it makes any difference. And I think that uh, Audrey, I'm gonna now share my um, my screen. Perfect. Sounds good. And uh, just make sure that uh, I see. Uh, Okay, do you see my screen? It looks great, thank you. Okay, and uh, if I don't see that well, can you put this on chat? Uh, okay, so uh, thank you, uh, uh, Michelle P, no, it's Michelle L. So uh, I hope. Uh, I think we already have been one hour into the field trip. So I'm gonna try to, we have two more sections. The two, the two next se sections are mostly a field section. We show slides of the field. Um, and uh, we should um, be able to do that in a shorter uh, time. Okay. And we'll have a, at the end a discussion about what, how much ice was in the central St. Lawrence lowland during MIS3, which is the objective of that trip. Just to mention that what Michelle has been really showing right now so far is that the uh, is if there is ice in the St. Lawrence lowland, there's a lot of impact in the Appalachian, in the Great Lakes, the drainage is completely inverted. Uh, so, so it has a, a lot of uh, significance in terms of interpretation of uh, stratigraphy uh, down down ice or so, uh, basically uh, in the states so uh, the blue the blue uh, uh, circle is basically uh, ar around the area that I'm going to be talking about which was 
originally the, the, the subject of the, of the field trip. I uh, just mentioned that uh, obviously um, we are talking about the St. Lawrence lowland. Uh, uh, first of all, I just want to see, do you see my uh, arrow? It's Audrey here, uh, yes, I can see. No, I can. Yep. Yeah, okay, okay. So uh, Montreal is here on the lower left. Quebec City is on the upper right. The St. Lawrence River is flowing obviously towards the northeast and uh, actually the uh, St. Lawrence uh, Gulf and Estuary is uh, outside of that slide. It will show a bit more uh, on the next slide. But uh, if this is a, a lowland, just maybe for the stu students, uh, uh, it's that because there are three main uh, geological areas in southern uh, Quebec and it's probably the same in several parts of uh, New, New England. We have the Precambrian Shield uh, which is a hard uh, their terrain consisting of the metamorphic rocks a bit higher. We have sedimentary rocks. Uh, the age uh, here is Cambro or division mostly. Uh, an interesting part for the quaternary uh, geology, uh, let's say the history of tracing uh, the uh, dispersal of uh, the um, Laurentide ice sheet, for instance is the fact that everything that is sort of a, a yellowish uh, orangish here in the center is uh, are mostly red uh, sandstone so they are very uh, they can be used for a, a little bit of tracing and after that we see a whole series of faults the main important one being the logan line which is the logan line cut across here the whole area and now we're getting into the appalachian the appalachian Obviously, it's uh, very well known. It's a set of uh, hills, elongated hills. We call it here mountains, but European, when they come here, they try really to find mountains. You know, it's just a little bit, it's kind, it's kind of a little bit higher. So, uh, I'm trying to, okay. Okay, now, uh, this is the view. If you are from the United States and you fly over, you are uh, the captain of an airplane and you're coming in uh, southern uh, Quebec. That's the view you may see if you are really high, obviously. So Montreal City again, Quebec, the St. Lawrence River. So you can imagine that every, every time a glacier uh, cross across uh, uh, Quebec City, it's going to block that drainage and it affects the whole North Amer Northeast American uh, drainage. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very important uh, anchor in terms of uh, stratigraphy. It's uh, the impact of the ice advance blocking the St. Lawrence River drainage. And uh, then we see in the St. Lawrence River a very, very rich stratigraphy, very uh, uh, diverse. And you will see a few of that in a few slides. So you can see Bar, Glacial Lake, when it's been pounded. You see uh, um, peat layers, uh, organic rich sand when you have a normal drainage, so no ice. Uh, you have a marine incursion in the St. Lawrence lowland when the land is, uh, uh, has been isostatically depressed. And now if you just look at the, uh, the landform, just, I uh, will just show you a few things. Like here, this is the St. Narcisse Moraine. This is the, the, we think this is the equivalent that's the response of the Laurentide ice sheet to the, uh, to the younger drives. You see a lot of uh, terrace and mostly they are from the Champlain Sea. And at the end, you can see even the drainage here around the Monte Region Hill, which are, uh, which are, um, have been uh, uh, engraved during the, uh, have been formed during the later stage of Lake Lamp Lampsidis. The Lake Lampsidis is the, uh, ancestor of the late St. Pierre. So that's a pretty nice uh, landscape. Uh, sometimes the slides don't advance, I don't know why. Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're gonna, the, the field trip actually, uh, the field trip was uh, planned to be held in the along the Saint Francois River, which you see here, and the uh, Richelieu River, Richelieu yeah, River, the Yamaskaran, sorry, the, the river. 
And uh, you would have seen sections along the river here, which are what we call the Pierreville sections. And uh, this is where Michel had drilled the, uh, uh, this uh, borehole where he found uh, some uh, uh, marine, marine, a uh, new marine unit and wood dated at around 30 to 35,000 years old. Uh, what is interesting, I, I will skip that one because we are already out of time. So that uh, land, landscape is uh, interesting. Uh, again, the section is here. Uh, this is where the drill hole was, uh, was done. And this is, let's see, the, the end of the Champlain Sea in this area. And we're going to see the re regression, the, let's say, the, we call that the, really a retraction instead of a regression, because we're going to talk about the lake. So this is Champlain Sea. And then after this is Lake uh, Lemsilis. Lem so there are three, and accompanying uh, three phases actually in the St. Lawrence River. That's another phase. And that's the latest phase, the, what we call the St. Bath. Shoreline. So uh, basically the area we would be visiting has been um, uh, exposed uh, um, during uh, the late uh, glacial. This is the a map from uh, Nelson Gant from the Geological Survey. We did a lot of the quaternary mapping work in the 50s and uh, we're going to see uh, uh, now the it's really a technical issue we have once in a while is that the slide will not advance. So I'm going to go to the first stop. It's a long time, like an hour and some. So, <laughs> so I'm going to show you uh, some of the of the area. Uh, basically, the Central Saint Lawrence Lowlands photography. This thing has been visited a long time ago. This is a very nice shot of Joseph Keel. He was. He is standing in front of the uh, what now we call the Lubinia Sand and uh, De Chalion Vars at the top. This was in a brickyard in 19. Well, the report is 1915, so I think the shot is probably around 1912. So it's more than 100 years ago, and um, uh, these are now thought to be uh, dated from the end of the interglacial. Um, uh, that was the uh, stratigraphy that uh, I put up many years later on the during my PhD, where I had already shown that well, it was my uh, uh, my thesis, if you will, that during MIS3 the Central Lawrence Lowland were open, and this was based on a lot of dates, TL dates at that time. Now it's also living a sense dates. So uh, I had a thought that maybe you would like to see a uh, a, um, a, a few uh, movies on the, what it would have been if you would have been with us. Now I just want to make sure that I'm going to show you a few movies. It's very, very short. First of all, I'm going to show you if we would have left Montreal and would have taken a bus to show you actually the danger of of uh, going on a field trip in Montreal, there's always a, a trick. So if you get in the bus and if you're late, you know what could happen. Uh, you could uh, miss the bus, so that's one thing you should never do. And then, oh yeah, I, was, uh, I did not remember, I already talked over that film. So that's the Kirk Bryan field trip today, okay? So going across the city, but we never know where we're going to go. Okay. And then we get to the site. And if you had make it, you would have been welcomed by me. And I'm trying to explain to you the stratigraphy. I'm standing at the, on the, or the vision red sandstone, discussing about the uh, stratigraphy on top of it. And as a, if you are a student or whatever, maybe you did not really listen to what I said. 
But uh, basically, I'm going to be, we're going to be talking about the stratigraphy that lays above this uh, observation limestone. So we have uh, here the, on the right, on the left hand side, the, uh, the till. Everything that's sort of reddish is still, then I told you, you can't really see it, obviously, because the section is not well exposed now. And you, there are barbs, sand, till, and so on. But it's, uh, these sections are really, really rich. Uh, actually, I, I'm going to show all the, the movies at the same time. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, well, that's another movie. Uh, Show you the the till how red it is. Look at this. This is very very red till. This is not rock. This is till. So I just want to mention there's a lot of uh, these stones. So there's a quite a good uh, amount of. Uh, Precambrian shield, which tells us that the Laurentide ice shield is responsible for that till. And there are even some concretion, as I uh, just mentioned in the film here, which uh, for those who are older know that there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the significance of their presence and the significance of their dates. I will not go on well for that. So, uh, and the uh, last, just last film, there's a few seconds. I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk a lot about what we call the uh, VFR Sand. Uh, I was there with uh, Francois. I was making a joke. Let the one be so. So this is what you would have seen. So what is important is that there's a lot of these sand and we're gonna be talking about that unit during that uh, the next uh, 20 minutes, 10, 15, 20 minutes, because these sands have a very, very important significance is that they're uh, um, sedimentary structures are indicative of a time when the drainage was inverted. If the drainage is inverted south of the St. Lawrence River, it means there is ice in the low, lowland progressing south, well, southeast or south. So the, the idea is that this sand is an indicator of built, built up of ice. So that was the uh, video presentation. I'm coming back here to the uh, right. Uh, okay. Okay. So I'm sorry. Now I'm going to go back to my original slide. Okay. So I'm going to go to uh, Saint Pierre area. Okay, so the, all of these sections, you know, I, I, I'm going to give you a, a description, a short description of what we would have seen and the type of sections we have. You can see this is a LIDAR. Uh, there are some the color are for the uh, uh, elevation. And we were talking about this just a few minutes before we started. Uh, if how much more we would have get uh, and understood if we would have had these LIDAR image in the past. Um, but obviously we don't have all the time to do it. But one thing we can, we can say is that here along the river, there are about, I would say over five uh, kilometers, there are so many sections. And it seems that most sections show two till with some stuff between the two tails, but there is a lot of uh, complexity in what happens between these two till. Uh, so it's quite rich and it's really too bad we could not have uh, done that field trip on the field. But maybe eventually we could do a, a Friends of the Pleistocene or something like that in IGC. Whatever. So, uh, so again, the uh, slide. Okay. Okay. So this is an old slide from my PhD. Uh, 
What you have, Trois-Rivières is here, Quebec City is, on, is outside here, and Montreal is outside on the southwest side. The Lake St. Pierre is here. And what you see here is the topography of the map, of the bed, bedrock. This is the what we call a, a structure contour map. And it was, it was very obvious from that that all the quaternary deposits we have, in which we have sub um, uh, uh, LGM, sub LGM, free LGM, I'm sorry, free LGM uh, material is, was, is a town actually in its, what I would call sub basin. Uh, gave name to Basin at that time, that was four years ago, but uh, I think it's still true. And uh, we will be talking mostly about Pierreville for first, this is where the most of the sections are. But there are very nice section at Les Vieilles Forges, this name will come very often. And Les Vieilles Forges is just on the, uh, the edge actually, the exit actually of the uh, Precambrian Shield in this basin. There is a high which is called St. Ancestors Ridge and another basin. In that basin, uh, you have the sections around a small village called Saint Pierre Le Bequet, and the name Saint Pierre comes on and on and on. Saint Pierre was even on the first dance garb uh, uh, ice core isotope stratigraphy in 1970. Uh, Saint Pierre is an interstitial, really well known. Uh, Pierreville has Saint Pierre sediment, which are non-glacial, which were used for uh, dating. Uh, in the in the program the uh, radiocarbon dating program of uh, Mitz uh, Swiber and uh, the paper was in 78 in science where you could show you could go really far with the C14. So in the area that I've shown you the uh, the the, uh, the lidar, but now we can see that in the same area you, see, you may recognize all these little uh, island. Uh, everything that is pink is free LGM. So it's a very, very rich area. I'm going to be talking about sections 98, which is about here, 99. These are all numbers of uh, Nelson Gab, 109 here in the south. Uh, again, I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah, so 98, 99, 109, 1098. It's a very, very old, old shot. Huh? That's, uh, this is a shot I took from a very bad PDF of Canadian General Hall of Earth Science, where I had the paper many years ago. And um, I just can't find that picture again. So that's the only one I have. And at the top, there's a till. And yet there's something here, which is a peat. And there is a man here standing here, which is one of my uh, it's a best friend, Pierre Pagé. He's standing on bars. But don't worry, I have it here. So um, in that section, showed at least uh, the upper part of the stratigraphy. So you have the Gen CD seal, which is the L LGM uh, seal, in which there were some calcareous concretion uh, that were striated, for which I got dates of about uh, 30,000. And there has been so much argument about that. I'm not going to get back into it now. Uh, this is overlying sand, which is probably the St. Pierre sand. We'll be back and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, uh, uh sediment that are St. Pierre sediment at that time. We now we call these uh, St. Maurice Rhythmite. I don't want to mix up anyone. What's important is just the superposition. Till, sand, lacustrine, peat, pluvial sand, varns. These are the Pierre Villebars, and this was known as the St. Pierre Pete. These letters refer to TL dates that uh, I have been running uh, when I was in my PhD with uh, Dave Huntley at SFU. Uh, so this is the, the, the uh, survivor date, 74,700. So, uh, so that's the St. Pierre section. That's the same section. I'm sorry, Pierre Ville, when after I did uh, my work, I did a lot of uh, paleo uh, uh, direction for uh, uh, the, uh, so the, the sand, uh, grain size, lots of dates, till fabric, uh, counted bars, there, and there are concretion here. And most importantly, the base of the section is, is not exposed. Uh, a few shots from the what I think is the equivalent of the VA4 sand, which uh, will be the on which I will focus uh, shortly. Uh, here I shot on the uh, the transition between the peat 
and the Lacassuim uh, sediment, I think that if someone wants to show what a conformable contact is, it's, it's, it's a, a very nice place. There's no erosion, and we can really go from the, the peat, organic-rich uh, silt, uh, silt with a little bit of organic, and then silt and sand. It's a very nice. So uh, this is when you, if you knew, uh, you do a luminescence dating, for instance, you may date the silt instead of the uh, organic rich, in which you can have some issues with the uh, geo, geo uh, chemistry of uranium, for instance, because you know that you're gonna if you date the silt, you date the, the organic here. This is an example of my theory. Uh, now. Uh, this is another section, uh, we call it Riviera Vache section. Uh, I kept, uh, we kept all the French name, Riviera Vache is the Cow River, if you will. Uh, we see again a till on top, a uh, Champlain Sea uh, clays and a uh, flow till at the top. There's lots of fossil here, a marine fossil. This is Le Glisso. the till should be uh, LGM, and then we have this non-glacial sequence where you have uh, um, silt sand with inverted drainage uh, and there's a lot of organic in it uh, there's uh, for instance there's uh, wood then you have the bars and then you have till and, on and at the bottom of the till of that till which is we think Illinoisian till uh, we found uh, many years ago uh, some um, uh, silt deformed and uh, Martin Clay worked with uh, Serge Oquetz, he found some uh, pollen in it, but not enough to make any interpretation. Um, so those sections, as I said, are quite interesting, very, very rich. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is another one showing the kind of uh, complexity we can have. We show you sections where there's no uh, deformation, but as soon as you move out, you can see glacial tectonic deformation of one unit. Uh, which could be brought up over a younger unit, which is the case in that case. Uh, so uh, th there's a lot of deformation at some places, some others there's no deformation, but one thing we should always, and I think this is a, a message that will be important for um, uh, future stratigraphers, that when you are in the center of a lowland, uh, whether there has been a lot of late glacial and Holocene history of development of a large river, such as the St. Lawrence River, we should always remember that there is an er erosional surface here, which probably have removed a lot of the information that uh, could have been useful. So we may be looking only at the bottom part of the whole stratigraphy. You know. Okay. Uh, uh, and the last uh, section, uh, section 99, which is the one where I was uh, standing. Uh, you see the bedrock at the bottom. The Bicanco Till, which is the Illinoisian expression of the uh, glaciation uh, of during MIS-6 in this area. There are nice structures like this fluting. This is an inter till fluting. Uh, Michel showed some uh, till, till wedge. There's a lot of sedimentary structure also in these uh, units that could be very interesting. There are, again, these bars, there's something really neat about these bars. This is a picture, it's in my PG. Uh, so it's a very old picture, so it's not that nice, but you can see that, I think, uh, can you see the scale? Okay, that scale here is one uh, centimeter. So that's the one centimeter, and you can see how many bars you have. So the there is about, uh, if I remember well, it's about a thousand bars. And um, they're a little bit thicker towards the end, but uh, not that much. So it seems to be really distal bars. Now, just to mention one thing is that I have a run, and Francois Aldi, who did a master thesis with me uh, some years late, later, we have done uh, linear sense dating on those. And uh, very surprisingly, it seems that the fine grain material that we find in what we call winter parts, which are the, the, really the darkest level here, uh, seems to be bleach enough for uh, TL days to be use, useful. At least we can use them as a relative dating tool. And uh, Francois, if you are interested, did a very interesting paper in, uh, I think it's in QG in uh, 1996 about 
the use of a of a luminescence for correlation purpose of glacial lacustrine uh, material, you know, at a unit. So it could be very interesting. So again, the sand, the silt, the till, uh, some uh, glacial till, float till, and the chimpanzee stuff there. Uh, okay, this is where I stand. This is a section 99 again, it's very simple. Bed, bedrock, till, um, sorry for the phone, I forgot to <laughs> shut it down. Uh, and then you have uh, bars and sand. These are phones that, uh, you know, they, uh, they are phones from the uh, United States, tell you that you're going to be put in jail if you don't answer, stuff like that. Okay, they're, they're done. Okay, sorry. So, uh, uh, showing you uh, what this is about. These are, we have seen these uh, these uh, movies. I wanted to show the movie in the, in the presentation. I find it was easier to show them all at the same time. So we have the till. Uh, look how red it is. It's really nice. And that till is so hard. It's like a rock, really. And um, I think a glacial uh, geology specialists or those who are interested in that kind of stuff. It's really one of the nicest exposure of till. Uh, so again, the section. So this is the varps I'll show you. We don't really see how thin they are until they start to dry, to dry up a bit. So that's the bar on top. Then you have the sand. We already showed you some shot with uh, Michel, uh, with uh, Francois Lee. Uh, very nice sand. There's a lot of uh, iron staining, as we can see, because uh, obviously uh, before the Saint Lawrence River cut across and exposed the sand, we had groundwater. Uh, that's right. It's a uh, history of groundwater. Pardon. Okay. So uh, one thing I want to insist here, you see you have these sand there. Okay. Uh, so the river is flowing this way. If you find sand that is going against the river on the southern side of the St. Lawrence Lowland, the St. Lawrence River, you need to have ice somewhere. It's very difficult to imagine anything else. And uh, so we use these kind of indicator as presence in the, in the basin somewhere, not that, that close by. It could be a 50 kilometer north or northeast uh, from there of a source of material that could be sand, silt. But there is, I will use a term that we use in sequence stress photography, there is aggradation. And there is aggradation and there is deposition because there's a lot of accommodation space in this basin. When the ice sheet is coming in, uh, let's say I, where I stand now, I'm about, uh, I would say about 30 meters above a modern sea level. And when the ice pulls in, as um, Michel showed, an example of the Lake Candona, but whatever lake, glacial lake you have, these lakes will have uh, will uh, have uh, beaches at uh, maybe the level of 200 uh, meter. So there you have a lot of space, a lot of accommodation space. That's very important. So you sample these, you say, oh, we're going to do some luminescence dating. Um, this is from my PhD work. So this is 1985. Uh, just to mention, in the Pierreville area, for instance, I did some uh, a tentative uh, co correlation between the two sections. Easy to correlate the upper till. Uh, less easy to correlate the sand and silt and organic rich uh, material. So I think there's a, there is a good possibility of facies change or maybe uh, erosion. Uh, there are the two varn sections, uh, we argue a lot about that. And there is the, uh, uh, what we call the Bacon Cold Silt, forget Odanak, it was a local name and uh, the bedrock. All these numbers are TL dates, and uh, these are TL dates obtained in the early 80s at the Dave Huntley's lab at SFU. And the, the reason why you have greater than ages is that uh, we, we realized that was fading. And uh, so the samples, uh, the age were 
a little bit uh, too, too young, but they were measured many weeks and months after irradiation. Now I'm getting into a detail that may not be that useful, but whoever is, uh, understands luminescence a little bit, I just want to say that it's not like greater than in the sense it could be, uh, let's say 72 could be uh, two, 200. Now we are, that's my guess, about 20% uh, too young maybe. That's ab about the, the range. So I think these are about 70. Here, the 34, are, I think there should be about 50. So that's why I think the same, the, the VA far sand, which are here at the, the top, they're not showing, but are about uh, 50 and so on. Uh, now, we're going to go to modern work. So at the end, but we're going to go as far in the lowlands, show you a few other sites. Um, so just to show here that we think we have uh, three glaciation. I uh, should I mentioned this again. Illinois is an early Wisconsin glaciation. I don't know why the eye is there. Classical Wisconsin, which is the, the term that the older people will understand. It's like the LGM, the one that will be deposited during LGM. And I love that expression, classical Wisconsin, because it's a kind of a, it's like the end of the, it's like the upper Wisconsin, but it's not exactly it. So we can keep a little bit of confusion, which we like to do in stratigraphy. <laughs> Sorry, Cedric. Uh, and we have the mid Wisconsin, which is a period of a uh, glacial retreat. And I go to the uh, Copley VA Fort, where actually are exposed the, the sand. Unfortunately, I don't have a shot of the sand. I, I just could not find them around there. But I have a few shots of the lower part, uh, thanks to a student uh, of mine, Thomas. So you have the uh, the Concord Seal here, the very old seal, very difficult to see. It's really at low uh, river level. It's a very hard seal again, pinkish a little bit. Um, on top of which you, you find peat, and you can see how compressed that peat is. So there's a lot of that peat in the St. Lawrence uh, lowland, and we used to amalgamate all of these peat together, and it's one heaven. It might be also, I'm not sure. But at the, uh, some time, uh, many years ago, then uh, at the St. Pierre Le Bequet site, which is one of the uh, type section, it is the type section for the St. Pierre. Nelson Gad had the three, uh, three peat layer, one at the bottom of, of the feet of the man here, there's a peat here. There's another one uh, where he's uh, using the shovel to show, and there's the, the topmost one on which the, this little brook uh, uh, flows up. And on top of that, you have gray bars, the are bars, which he, he called, Nelson Gad called gray bars, and we have kept that name because it sort of tells us, it, it's, it's a kind of objective way to describe this unit, but, but the are bars, it's a visual like costume name. Now I'm going to go to in the uh, Bacon Core area to show you again. And now, now I'm, I'm trying to focus more on what we call the Vieille Forge Sand. And you'll see a lot of slides that are uh, a courtesy of uh, uh, Pierre Marc uh, Godbout. He did the. Uh... Okay. Uh, Pierre Marc Godbout, who has done a, a master thesis with me, and he worked a lot in the Bacon Core area. And this is a picture from Nelson Gann on the left, and this is uh, Pierre Marc on the right hand side. Actually, this is Guillaume Alain, another colleague of, of us working at the Quebec uh, survey. Um, this is the same uh, section. Well, you can see how these uh, sections evolve. We don't see that much nowadays, but in some cases, we see better some new sections that they used to be available in the past. And basically, what you see is a lot of sand. There's till and barns, but there's a lot of sand. Okay. Uh, a lot of these sand, what I would call Saint Pierre, uh, no, I'm sorry, um, the eighth percent are exposed in the southern, on the southern shore of the Saint Lawrence lowland, uh, Saint Lawrence River. I'm sorry. So everything that is uh, yellow are, are truly VA4 sand. So it means the MIS3 distal proglacial sand. See a lot of these. The, the orange one are late glacial sand on which we have a luminescence signal showing us that they are reworked 
from the middle Wisconsin sand. We have grains that are, are quite young, 8,000, 9,000, and we have other grains giving us dates of uh, 40,000 and more. So um, it's very interesting to see this, uh, the importance of recycling of older material in the quaternary uh, specifically. Uh, the, uh, Pierre Marc did a lot of the shots, and uh, all these are what we call VA4 sand at different uh, sections. Uh, like this one is really neat because the, the sand is flowing to us, uh, but the river is, is going on towards the left. Okay, that's the Big Uncle River going towards the west, uh, it's towards north, uh, northwest, but on that slide it's flowing west, but the sand is flowing, um, I'm sorry, left and it's, it's flowing towards us. It's difficult to see, but uh, I think I have another one here. Yeah, okay. So you have some sand going downriver, and as you go up in the section, and it goes from really uh, organic, organic silt, 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 a bit of organic, a lot of it is downriver, and then at some point, and we don't really see a definite change, but at some point on the upper, in the upper part of the section, it's going upriver. And those sands are all abutting against uh, the bedrock or some uh, pre, uh, pre VA forest uh, sand. And they are, uh, um, yeah, this is a 3D image. Uh, this was part of the uh, Pierre Martin work. Uh, and we can see in the, um, this is mostly sub sill, sub density cell sand. It is uh, found here and there. It's very important, obviously, in hydrogeology because it's a uh, it's a it's a, a very well known aquifer. Just uh, anecdotically, uh, uh, it's also an area where there was some drilling for uh, um, shale gas, uh, and uh, pe the, sh the the people doing the drilling for the shale gas use. Uh, water from that uh, aquifer because it's really located along the same unit that are, it seems to be, uh, wasn't the target of the, of the work. Okay, again, just to show you there's so much material, so much sand. Again, uh, Guillaume, I don't know, so, you know, I think it's, it's leaves. So this is uh, an example of a, a cross section from the south southeast to north Northwest and this sand number 10 here is uh, an example of the A4 sand. Nine is what we call the um, uh, um, Saint Maurice Ritmite or the Gravars. All these are due to the advance of the Laurentide ice sheet during the, um, the last uh, glacial advance. So the importance is it's very important to know. How, uh, what is the age of that? What is the age of this uh, material? Uh, okay, uh, that's a blow up here. You can see a bit better. It's very interesting that there is a lot, well, it's only one example here, but in the central St. Lawrence lowland, a lot of the Champlain C clay are encased inside channel, uh, former channel, which I think, uh, according to the age of the material that is being eroded, is probably related with the late glacial uh, history of uh, uh, catastrophic drainage of Lake uh, Candona. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, so the principle here in terms of stratigraphy is to say, well, we have ice advancing, and this was very well described in a paper, a sequence of stratigraphy paper by Brookfield and Martini in 1999, where you have uh, a gradation. It's the only way you can really explain aggradation. You create space because the ice is, is obviously depressing the land and you accumulate the sediment because you have a source and the source is the ice. Now, can we date that? That's another question. So uh, Pierre Marc, uh, actually he did the work that we've been doing that for some time, but he did it very systematically and he did uh, uh, RSL dates so it's just, I'm gonna just break up for a few seconds explaining what we do here. These are luminescence date, they're based on feldspar. 
we are trying to use quartz in the part of the world and of course it's very dim. This being said, I should mention that I, I produced the first yield date of quartz in 1983-82. For some reason there was some TL uh, that I could use for that. Uh, but it's very, very difficult to uh, to date the quartz using optical, well, OSL, uh, because the uh, most of the quartz grain uh, are not sensitive enough to uh, the uh, stimulating light. So we then have to work on feldspar. That's the main reason why I became a specialist of feldspar, that way I cannot really work on quartz. Uh, so feldspar um, have a lot of light. They can the signal can grow up to a very high dose. It means in terms of age, we can use it to date uh, events that could go beyond 300,000, 400,000 years. So it's about 10 times more than uh, radiocarbon. So that's a lot of advantage, but um, nature being what it wants to be, there's always a problem somewhere. And the problem with Felspar is that the signal is not stable over time. And we have a term for this in a sense, I think we call it uh, anomalous fading. So we, I must say, I spent a lot of time trying to find out ways to circumvent fading, correct for fading, try to find a non-fading non uh, signal. Uh, there are some colleagues did the excellent work in uh, Europe and China. Mm -hmm found some methods that can deal with that. Unfortunately, they are not, we cannot apply these methods here. We could discuss that in the question of uh, time uh, later. Um, but these are based on Felsmar and we have used a correction for those who know luminescence. We're using the, uh, this is the, what I call the DRC, the dose rate correction method, uh, which I uh, published in 2003. And, um, if we use the Ansley and Lamotte uh, 2001 uh, correction method, we basically are about almost the same age. So we had ages, luminescence ages from the sand, all series of date, and they are very systematic. They are always between 40 and 50, 55. So this one is uh, 50, uh, 49 plus minus 4. This one 47, that's the shot I showed you. 47 plus minus three. Um, okay, okay, that, that's another, there's two or three more, but I'll show them at the end when I, in the other section, uh, in the last section of our field trip, when we will discuss, uh, we'll look at all the days we obtain. Now in the Appalachian, Michel talked a lot about the gears. Uh, the gears is that lake that existed and for which the existence requires ice in the St. Lawrence lowland. Olivier Caron did a PhD uh, with me, and uh, I should mention, I'm going to show you some dates, but uh, Francois Alzi also did uh, some dating in the Gears formation. The Gears formation, maybe I should add before I go on, that it's a very complex unit, and uh, at Bill Shields and uh, uh, we have a paper in veterinary research. Uh, you may want to look at it, uh, I think, uh, 2019 or 2020. Um, and it's made up of three facies. So there is this course uh, at the bottom. There is a proximal facies, which well, I would guess is like the retreat, retreat phases here. And these are really uh, turbiditic in uh, character. And after you have sand, and that sand gravel can take a lot of many, many, uh, many uh, features. It can be uh, can be uh, uh, proximal, it can be distal, and then you have these these uh, fine grain bars, much finer, which seems to indicate ice is re-advancing. And that was the big discussion. I was at the ice completely been removed from the Appalachian front at any time during MIS three. Uh, the conclusion of McDonald and Shields in 1971, which I think Bill would still support now, is that uh, no, there was always ice in the lowland during uh, from the deposition of the Shodziat Hill way up to the deposition of the Lenard Hill. But for our discussion here and the objective of our field trip is what is the age of that re-advance here? And, um, so just uh, again, uh, another slide that uh, Michelle showed. Uh, it's not the same, but uh, 
It's uh, Saint-François River Watershed, Chauvier River Watershed. I'm going to show you uh, some work we've done in the upper Chauvier River Watershed. Uh, you can see that uh, the St. Lawrence, I mean, St. Francois River is here, Chaudière River. This is obviously the modern drainage basin. But you can imagine that many years ago, 40, uh, 40, 40 50,000 years ago, uh, this could be a place where there has a lot of uh, subglacial drainage of material coming in the basin. Okay? So, um, as you did uh, fantastic uh, work in uh, doing the characterization of this uh, gears, these uh, gears unit. We look at the uh, borehole stratigraphy uh, and did the 3D model. And you can see there's an extensive distribution of these midwest consonant gears uh, unit in uh, most of the small, any small valley in the central and the Appalachian would have most probably a little bit of gears. And yeah, this is the fine grain uh, facies, the upper one. Um, and we find concretion in those. Obviously, we don't have time to go through all this concretion business. It's, it's very exciting, but it's more a, ge a geochemical uh, object of interest. And you have the, the barns, the barns here. And at the top, you have these, um, you have, oh yeah, you have the sand. You have some very nice conformable contact. Look at these beautiful barns. And you have the seal on top, the uh, linear seal, seal, which you would call here the draw left lamp seal. It's, a, it's a, a, a member of the linear seal. So, so what we, Charles-Louis um, Caron did, this is we're in the upper Chaudière River here. Uh, and you can imagine the glacial lake uh, gears. And in the glacial lake gears, once in a while, in the upper reach of it, depending on how much ice there is in, in Maine, you can imagine, uh, let's say there's not much ice, or there is a bit of ice, I'm not sure, but there could be some, uh, what we call meteoric, uh, meteoric, meteoric uh, delta. And these one we can expect, they can be bleached. Uh, there's a good chance that the material was already standing, already in the landscape, and could have been uh, um, um, eroded and transported in the basin. And indeed, uh, we have. Again, 45,000 plus minus five, about 10% 10, 10 uh, error, but we still have the same age. So I'm getting, getting to the conclusion of my part. So the, well, there was this perspective in terms of, uh, of space, aggradation, accommodation space. So now we are adding time and we can see that that blanket of material is probably time transgressive. We can't, I don't think we can see it with the, uh, resolution of luminescence. But we can say that that would be uh, my uh, argument, that we have a blanket of time transgressive sand, pro-glacial sand, between 50 and 40,000 uh, years ago. So it's a bit older than the uh, resocarbon date on uh, the wood that Michel just described, but I think I'm, I'm going to now leave him to talk about his uh, Material. I could have uh, could receive some question here. If there's any. Is it uh, everyone? Do you hear me? <laughs> You're doing great. Yes. Yeah, I do. I do hear you. Okay. I was. I was just wondering if I had forty minutes. Uh, to the wall. <laughs> okay, I, I can see a question from Adam Iris. Uh, going back to the inverted drainage record in the sand. How widespread can you find evidence for that inverted drainage? That's a very good uh, question. I tried to show it with the, um, uh, uh, the um, in the Bitcoin core area, uh, where I showed this, um, it's coming up. Uh, nah, voila. This is only in one uh, one of the main river draining into the St. Lawrence River. Uh, and there are quite a few of these rivers. Every time I see a section that is standing with till underneath that, there is an inverted drainage uh, feature, like a sedimentary structure, channel. Obviously, uh, when we are lucky, we have even deformation 
uh, subglacial deformation of these sand because you can imagine that when the ice is advancing, the, uh, we are now dealing with a deformable bed. And the, that sand is on top of a, uh, a very, I think it's quite common that there are some uh, uh, impervious layer, like the sand of a sweet mic, like these bars, we call gray bars, whatever. The sand is coming on top, and then the ice is coming, flowing over it. So we have very uh, interesting uh, glacial dynamic uh, context. We have a very interesting glacial dynamic context. But it is very extensive. Uh, another question, have you found any evidence of aeolian sand transport in your area? Uh, you know, I love that question because most of the luminescence uh, ages, even though we can argue maybe they're a little bit too old, I, I will discuss that in the next uh, section in the discussion. I don't think they are old. I think uh, they are pretty much all uh, very well bleached. Well, uh, uh, yeah, you know, because I see another question, I will come to it after Sabina. Mary Sabina. Uh, they are so well bleached that I wonder, it's, I don't think the bleaching is happening when the ice sheet is advancing and the, you have this distal outwash. I think the distal outwash is from material that has been very well exposed to uh, sunlight. So much so that I think that there is a lot of this material was aeolian first and then brought into the basin. Uh, like blowouts or whatever, I don't really know because I think at the end, when the build up of the ice is starting, for some reason, I don't know, uh, what is the role of, uh, what is the evolution of ve vegetation when the ice is advancing slowly? Uh, if, uh, is there any uh, chance to have a lot of aeolian sand? This, uh, but I should say at the end that we don't see aeolian, we don't see any form, so there's no uh, length, there's no aeolian large dune system, for instance, and the underneath the ice sheet, we don't see it. So uh, now that I have, I don't know if it's okay for the question. It's possible that the sand deposit with inverted polygon might be slack water deposit related to flooding events from upstream on the St. Lawrence. Well, I don't think it's possible, I'll tell you why, because uh, most of these uh, sand are very high in the uh, topography compared to the St. Lawrence River base level. Uh, even though we can say, well, the base level was high, might have been higher. Uh, they are really entrenched, if I could use that term, entrenched in the, uh, these affluent river valleys. They are up river uh, for 10 kilometer, 15 kilometer, you know. So, um, and the sedimentary structure have nothing to do with uh, slack water. There's no flazer and stuff like that. So that would be my answer to uh, this question for the, the slack water deposit. Uh, there is a question by uh, Tom Davis. What is the current interpretation of the two finite AMSC 14 age, uh, et cetera? Well, it is coming up indeed. Uh, um, so we'll talk about it in the next uh, section. Okay, any more questions? If not, we'll, I, I will give uh, the mic to Mike, <laughs> to Michelle, if uh, there's no more uh, questions. Thank you. I will talk about the sense dating also. Uh, well, I have two or three slides about uh, my work on single grain in the last uh, section. But, Okay, Michelle, I think you can go, I don't know. I will ask uh, Julie, Julie is the boss. Uh, Judy, oh, are we good? Uh, yeah, you're good. I think, um, you know, we're coming up on two hours, but. Uh, the the rest is, uh, is shorter, you know, it's quite okay. short. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Uh, my screen. Okay. My okay. screen is gone. You should now see it. Okay, good. Okay. I'll, uh, Michel, on a peu de temps, voici l'alliance peu plus vite. Okay. So, he, sorry, why, did, why I wanted. Okay. Is it okay now? It's okay for me. Yeah. 
Yep. Okay. So essentially, um, our, this map shows the location of this uh, of RS4, which we've talked about uh, quite a bit in in prior discussions. <clears throat> so here's the next slide. I don't know. There is a lag and. When you have a problem, I think you you click on the slide and then after you put on you push on the button next slide. On dirait que ça le réactive. Okay. Click dessus, puis après tu vois ça le réactive. C'est ce que je réalise. Okay. Okay. So this is a map. You should use the Masque River. Uh, uh, here at at the south, it's the uh, Vermont. Uh, Vermont and uh, U.S. border, if you want, and essentially, uh, this map shows the thickness of uh, uh, clay, uh, of Champlain Sea clay. We we can't we are not always sure that it's entirely Champlain Sea clay, but it's definitely clay that is sits above till. So, in, in essence. There is a large area uh, which is covered by thick clay around RS4, and <clears throat> this was uh, because of that thick clay cover. The uh, the remain the underlying water the water that the, the groundwater sorry that underlies the this area uh, a large area with the dotted line as I think you can see here this black dotted line is the area an area of brackish groundwater it's there been, there's been the, an open file report uh mentioned there and also uh a, a paper has been published on it so essentially water uh, below that champlain sea clay in that area is considered immobile however uh it, or as very low mobility if you want a very low replenishment so essentially it's uh, it's unusable for uh, consummation and it's the context in which we've uh, I'll try and click again on that slide to make sure that I can change so that's the uh, two the, the 2d view as you know it's perfectly flat on the, almost perfectly flat on the surface and we dug, uh, we did um, uh, seismic reflection surveys. We uh, looked at all the uh, subsurface data, hydro hydrogeological or geotechnical reports to and, and water well records. And we, we were able to construct uh, these sections. Uh, <clears throat> RS4 was in an area, is in an, was, was drilled in an area where uh, there was a fairly large thickness of sub uh, of material underneath uh, Champlain Sea clay, but it's it's very close to the Appalachian Piedmont. This is pretty well the Appalachian Piedmont that starts at this little brook here, and uh, again on the Piedmont uh, till is uh, relatively thick, much thinner in in the, in the lowland underneath. So here, uh, th this map, sh this uh, sorry slide shows uh, uh, the uh, seismic reflection data that we had conducted in this area. We had about uh, 100 linear kilometers of seismic reflection data like this, uh, but it, <laughs> and essentially this allowed us to identify, for instance, in RS4, and we were wondering what it was. Uh, another area that was a uh, thick sub clay deposit that we also investigated, but this one uh, was simply uh, uh, <coughs> sands uh, that are interpreted because of the sh as as being an esker body. So essentially, these are the four uh, sonic drill holes that we carried out in the uh, Shadia River. Unfortunately. Uh, at RS4, uh, sorry, so in, in RS4, uh, some of the core was mishandled, and we weren't. And when we found 
some uh, some organic some sorry some uh, marine material in there. Uh, we were wondering whether or not we had mishandled the, the original core, so we went over and recored uh, from uh, the base of the Champlain Sea Clay down into the other uh, marine unit. So this is what you what is shown here, uh, the recore. And uh, yeah, I guess that's okay. So essentially, what we found when we when we record uh, is established the proper stratigraphy above, and also uh, we're con confident about these dates that were are are also below the, pro the the area that was considered problematic. So essentially we got uh, two radiocarbon dates from plant fragments. Sorry, I'll, I'll remove the chatterbox so that I can see, whoops. Uh, uh, we, we found plant fragments. Uh, how can I close this? Sorry about this, everyone. Uh, so I can't remove the box anyway. So essentially, uh, uh, we could we observed uh, these are samples that were submitted to Martin Lavoie, Laval University, and essentially his lab uh, reported plant fragments of various kinds, uh, including sphagnum, brown mosses, lyrix, lyricina needles. That's large and PCO, that's uh, spruce needles, as well as uh, uh, butulaceae seeds, uh, butulaceae is uh, birch, sorry, seeds, and so on. Same thing, more or less, in, in the lower sample. So essentially, we had, we extracted uh, reliable macro fossils or plant remains and had them dated. So essentially, these are the two dates, 31,270 BP and 33,000. So, and the next slide shows a little bit, uh, sorry, the transition from, uh, from that to the organic. This is, this is a photo that I took at the base of a, uh, of the uh, marine unit that overlies uh, these uh, plant-bearing bed. Essentially, it, so, it shows that it, the, uh, plant fragments can be found in, let's say, uh, two or three centimeters of, of the marine uh, silt. And essentially, after that, they disappear. So this is the underside of the core, uh, which broke off right at, uh, at, at that location. So it does show a little bit what it looks like. Uh, these, of course, are considered to have been redeposited re in from the underlying alluvial sands or other sites in the lowlands, and were not used for radiocarbon dating. Here is the foraminiferal record uh, of that site. So uh, here you have uh, the, the series of samples. Essentially, the Champlain C material shows the the classical transition from zone C to zone A. Uh, and these these are zones that uh, that uh, were well described in uh, Jean-Pierre Guilbeault's paper. And uh, here we have the till unit and the laminated clay and then uh, the micaceous uh, a black micaceous, I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, sand that un underlies the pre-LGM clay. So uh, Jean-Pierre uh, uh, reported that uh, he had never before seen this, this type of assemblage. It's, it's a common cold water foraminiferal assemblage, but nothing like that is obvious in the Champlain Seas. So it's, it was a little bit of a different setting uh, than the classical uh, Champlain Sea stuff. So. Uh, this shows uh, 
the where this where this fits into the regional stratigraphy. So essentially, these are uh, let's say thir thirty. The, the, these radiocarbon dates cover calibrated ages from roughly 35,000 to 38,000 years BP. And uh, really, there is no reason to suspect their validity. At least I don't see any. Maybe someone can um, can find something wrong with them, but I've I have no reason. There is. No real, there's no modern or Holocene groundwater circulation. It's it's covered by thick impermeable marine clays, and they're from uh, plant fragments. Um, they're not from uh, carbonate or shell material, which are often considered to be problematic. Oh yes, by the way, the marine unit we cannot retrieve enough. Uh, forams uh, to or ostracods to have them dated directly i suppose uh, it, it, we would in order to do that we would have to recore and uh, it, it would it would only bring uh, i think possibly po problematic ages uh, on carbonates their calibrated ages as i was saying earlier are relatively consistent with uh, uh, IRSL ages from the Vieille Sen, and hence the need to reassess the regional stratigraphic succession. Here is on the, on the right hand, you can see, of course, this stratigraphic column which characterizes the, the three till stratigraphic column that, that characterizes the lowland. But we have to we have to find uh, how. Uh, these the marine unit and the fluvial unit uh, fit best the, the stratigraphic record because of uh, the stratigraphic superposition also of these uh, of till marine and fluvial is is unlike for instance that of the lateral clay uh, we we have to exclude a possible correlation between uh, the, the two the two the two, let's say, units. And of course, oops, sorry. It, from from elsewhere in the lowlands, there are also uh, additional radiocarbon ages uh, of mid Wisconsin ages. These, uh, this is one that uh, my colleague Pierre Richard at University of Montreal. I don't know if he's around with us. Uh, had collected from the from his, his scoring uh, on top of Mount, Mount Saint Hilaire. It's a Toronto isotrace date of 31, and I've not tried to calibrate them, but 31 2000, uh, 31 sorry 220, ages, and also one that comes from the mass a master's thesis that we had uh, in in one of our high, early hydrogeology project from Saint Laurent from saint Leonard de Palneuf. It's near the edge of the Laurentians, so completely on the other side. And it was totally expected because that, when we when we drilled through that unit, we were expecting Champlain C, C, Champlain C material, and which we did find, we not sorry, not Champlain C, but we find <laughs> laminated uh, silty clay. So we thought it'd be, uh, early Champlain C stuff. So essentially, uh, when I sent this to Jean-Pierre, uh, he told me, uh, listen, uh, there are organics. It's unlike anything that we've ever had uh, in the Champlain C. In the Champlain C, you never find uh, 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 plant debris and that sort of thing. So uh, so I had I had it dated. And it's uh, at the uh, Geochron lab, 28,910. And at the time, it was uh, a lone, a single date uh, uh, with no, nothing else to, to report on. So we never actually published it. It remained in, the th in, his, in uh, Frederick's uh, master's thesis. It was obtained from plant debris characteristic of subarctic lacustrine environments. We had uh, 
plant remains extracted and submitted for radiocarbon dating. So it, again, it's considered a, rely, a fairly reliable date. We have no, no reason to suspect uh, anything wrong. And as you notice, it's right next to the St. Narciss Moraine. And what, not, what needs to be said about this, this implies that the lake level was at least 150 meters. The, the lake sediments, and they're not sh very shallow water uh, environment, but uh, it's, it, it, it implies that uh, we have a bit, uh, not very well, not completely understood uh, how this lake was blocked uh, in, in the St. Lawrence Valley at that location on the edge of, and it's a fairly open valley, so on the edge of the Laurentians. So we think that the St. Lawrence Valley was deglaciated for at least a few thousand years during this three. With what Michel has shown us earlier, I would say more than this as well. Uh, the, the ice sheet has ret had retreated to the southern edge of the shield during the Younger Dryas or St. Narciss Marine prior to mist uh, to uh, uh, the last glacial maximum. Because of glacial acid stack loading, relative sea level in mid Wisconsin in the in the St. Lawrence estuary, and these these are things that we will uh, see in the in the previous slides, have been as high as 60 meters to allow. Atlantic waters to get across the Quebec City Sill and invade the lowlands. And uh, of course, uh, it would be nice to, if we could find more sites with uh, where we could conduct paleoecological paleo work uh, to further document uh, this uh, end or the stop part of the of the mystery interval in the St. Lawrence Solan. And I think that's it for me. Any question? As you see, Audrey, uh, the uh, the noise from outside my office is quietened down. So as as quiet, yeah. I'm not sure exactly about how to say, but anyway, does anyone have any question concerning this? I, I'm not too good at uh, looking at chat boxes, but uh, let me see. So, so, so no question here. Uh, Tom Davis uh, from New Hampshire. Um, oh, hello, Tom. Yep. So fantastic job, guys. Uh, this is a, just a fabulous field trip. Um, <laughs> so I, I was really sorry that the MIS uh, topical session uh, has been now postponed until Portland next year. But uh, this last section, uh, describing those two MIS uh, radiocarbon ages, plus the additional two, um, I think are gonna be fundamental uh, in, in that session uh, for everyone here who's been following this um, controversy. Uh, I think this promises to be a, a really fabulous session next year, and we will probably hear a lot more about these ages then. So I did want to point out, and I think I have to uh, uh, at least Michel uh, Perrant, that there is one radiocarbon age from, from wood. And AM, uh, it's a conventional age, but it was a large chunk of wood found in a core from South Branch Pond in northern Maine, north of Mount Katahdin, that dates to the same time period. So again, I don't think Scott Anderson, who published in CJES, I think it's back in the 70s, uh, has any reason to suspect uh, uh, anything uh, peculiar about that other than uh, that part of Maine must have been ice-free then. So that fits into um, this, this controversy very nicely, I think. So, but thanks again, guys. This was great. Thank you, Tom. Um, I, I could add, we have a last uh, bit of slide to show the conclusion of that. I don't know if people want to stay around or because we we thought there would be a discussion. Or you, we could want for that one. 
We we can. Is do you have the slides or yeah, are yeah, they? They're ready. They're ready. I can show you now. Okay, then we can wrap up. We're slowly starting to lose people. Yeah, I know. That's why I I thought that would intervene here. So uh, what was that? <laughs> Okay, and uh, just a wrap up. Is it okay? Do you see it? Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just want to wrap up right. uh, because uh, right. we can see the discussion. So at the end, finally, what we have is uh, are these uh, we have a physical superposed position. We are we have a lot of questions about the nature, the stratigraphic position of marine incursion. And this one of uh, Michel, described by Michel, is we can dis this is one that we can discuss about a lot. Uh, but we have a, a very strong climatic stratigraphy, uh, so let's say, frame framework. It's very difficult to identify Sangamonian. We don't really see a lot of it. I have some luminescence dating now that uh, of some sections that might indicate the presence of Sangamonian. But this is for our next uh, next next talk. And we are basically taking up the hypothesis A hey, with the a breakup of uh, MIS-3 uh, during, during which there was no ice in the central Islands. lowland. How, when was the last three advance difficult to tell? We, I just want to sum up the age. So for the, the age of DVA torsion luminescence, we had uh, 28, uh, 39, but these age are, I think it's about 50. And we have a lot of finite age RRSL on the VA Forge, uh, many sites. They basically are always around 40 to 50 years, about 45. And the, the question in luminescence is are these too old due to the presence of unbleached grain? So, uh, just to show you, if you have, would have grains that would have a lot of uh, sediment, that would have a lot of grains that are not really well bleached, so that would yield age that would be too old. We will have a distribution of age that will be made of uh, many modes. Let's say these, these will be age. Let's say, and from these into age, you have many modes. If you actually look at the results, we see really a lot of samples that have always the same age and some older age, which are pro probably uh, um, early with consonant. So, what I did is that I rerun uh, a lot of these uh, VA4 the stand using. Sing, single grain. And what we see when we use single grain is that most of them are made up of a very, very nice single population of grain. So that's the argument to say that probably these age are really reliable and are based on the measurement of grains that have seen the light, as we would say. I don't know <laughs> if everyone will see the light in the next November term, but that's another question. Uh, <laughs> And we can see that uh, the day for become poor area gears. It's always, we always see these very unimodal distribution of age. So uh, the, argue, the argument would be that apparently not, they are not too old. And we would argue that the positional age is about 40 to 55. So I was saying, Michelle, is that, so we have a day for 40 to 55. Uh, I have ages 55, 60 to the same year, and let's leave out till 80. So we have a, we're starting to build up a luminescence chronology, which would be very interesting for the near future. I just want to, well, this is the slide that Michel showed. So there are ages that seems to be younger, that seems to be going against the idea that the ice sheet is advancing at 40. But I think we are now in the fine tuning of that because if you take the oldest cal calibration here, you are about 39, you know. So considering the uncertainty we have on calibration of the residual carbon, considering the uncertainty that we have in luminescence, it seems to be relatively consistent. Personally, I, I, I find it di difficult to understand why, how we would have a marine incursion at, uh, at about that age, that I will not discuss that at this stage. It's like uh, we are late a bit, so these. these are the other dates that we shall uh, would have talked about that there are ages and at age elsewhere. Uh, yeah, the, the main uh, the main difficulty to... with these is that they're mostly marine shell ages. They are marine shell ages. So they're not considered to be uh, all that reliable. Yeah, I just want to finish because people are leaving. So when you look at the time space, uh, 
di diagram of, uh, uh, of the ice sheet, and I had the great legacy what I presented at Tinkwa last year. We have a, got a good, very good evidence for a retreat of uh, these are luminescence date. Now you have these dates now here at uh, the, the St. Francis of 34 to 36, maybe a bit older, RSL 40 to 55, of retreat of ice. Now, how much retreat of ice? That's the whole question that is still open. Um, I'm going quickly because I know people are leaving now. Uh, how much ice? So if I take RSL, uh, I would say 50, 60, maybe 40. Maybe I, I forgot to put this, but I can show you. There is some ice in the basin here. Somewhere in the basin north of the St. Lawrence lowland, there's enough ice to build, to cut the uh, drainage, the St. Lawrence drainage in Quebec City and, uh, and to produce these uh, distal, maybe outwash, I don't know, which we call the gay far Um So the, how much ice, maybe dredge and Tor, Tor Lefson, after the review in 1987, uh, suggested something like that, a little bit of ice in Quebec. We think actually, Michel and I both think that there, there ought to be some ice in central Quebec for some time, a certain thickness of ice, and it probably pers persisted toward, uh, across the MIST. Uh, my RRSL work seems to sort of support more the ICE 5G model or you have ice at 44,000 somewhere south. And obviously we don't really talk about the shape of that ice, but because I think in Quebec, it's more around the center of the southern, uh, Quebec, I mean, central of Quebec, that's possible. So uh, before we go on, we could have some discussion and question, but I would really want to thank Julie, who uh, uh, accepted to be the uh, mod moderator of this. And, and a very special thank to Audrey uh, Yoon. I'm sorry about the pronunciation. I think it's a good one. She is an incredibly uh, patient. And she has to help us, uh, Michelle, uh, both Michelle, to, uh, to go through these uh, new technique of uh, virtual meeting. And uh, she had to wait for us, I don't know how long. So I really want to uh, uh, thank her for that. So for us, that's all we wanted to show. Uh, I don't know if we still have time for a few questions, but uh, uh, it's all we could Yeah, I think if, if anyone has any burning questions. Um, uh, if not, it's going to okay, be next we'll year in person. Yeah. yeah, we'll take them up next year. Yeah. Um, is there anyone with a can Can, can, can I be wait? heard? Yes, Dan? Yeah. Oh, I just wondering what you're going to do with our glacial advance that I think we pretty well documented in central New York, just in the Cayuga Lake area that had a, has a date of slightly younger than 35k radiocarbon, and and also Dick Young has seen that same advance over in the Genesee Valley area. So to us, there's definitely MS MIS three ice that came down as far as central New York. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the uh, the first part. Uh, where is this date? Where's the date or where's the site? The site, I'm sorry, the site. Yeah. The site is just at the south end of Lake Cayuga. Okay. Six Mile Creek. Uh, we published it in, I don't know, 2013. It was Kerrig and Miller. Poor Norton's not alive anymore, but. Okay. And yes, yeah, you. No, and ahead. Dick Young, previously to that, published evidence for that same glacial advance over in the Genesee Valley, uh, south of Lake Ontario. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it seems to be pretty well documented. We don't have that many sites because we don't have that many pre-LGM sites yet identified in Central New York. Mm -hmm. But what you mean to say is that uh, it is coherent with the uh, ice advancing at uh, 3540, or you find it too early or too late? But this is what I'm trying to well, get at. Okay, this is a proglacial lake uh, that okay. that uh, the oldest dates. Well, no, the, the dates are basically 35,000. So the ice advance which is documented by a till uh, was slightly younger than that, but probably not very much younger at all. 
And we also have another site close by that we're going to publish on. That's forty-two thousand. That's a good a good date. Three or four radiocarbon dates uh, that show a <clears throat> a very cold tundra environment. Mm -hmm. So the ice wasn't that far away at forty-two thousand either. We don't think. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it might uh, be coherent with uh, luminescence dating uh, with uh, 40 to 50 k, like uh, earlier events than, yeah. than after 30 and some 32. Yeah. Well, 32. the, sto the story so, that, yeah. that we pushed was that MS3, MIS3 had a big fluctuations in, in temperature and climate. There were times when it was really relatively warm. It was uh, even warmer than boreal and the area and then other times when there was ice so i think maybe we got to get an idea that mis3 was a strange period of time it's a pretty long period of time too yes it is yeah 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 and there's a lot of argument about them we did not mention pico again but uh, yeah, along the U u.s atlantic coast there are some evidence for a uh, high sea level at uh, 38 40 based on uh, optical dating uh, osl date of course um, uh, which actually led uh, Tamara Pico to think uh, to, uh, to suggest that there was not that much ice on the eastern board. Uh, uh, so, um, but uh, this being said, I mean, there's lots of uh, complexity that are arising, but there would have been more if it would not have been at the limit of the C14. And it always uh, uh, raises a question about uh, we always have to discuss and how reliable are the dates. Uh, I'll be fine, it, but now I, I'm sure with the with the AMS now we have really uh, gave much more credibility to these things. We've been trying to be very careful with our well, what, with what we date. We try to stay to things like dryest leaves or or PCO, uh needles and things like that. And make sure that we don't get. We've had problems with reworked wood. Re wood can give really old, erroneous ages. So. You, you really mm -hmm. have to be careful and not mix your sample with a whole bunch of different plants. Yeah, indeed. We yeah. have a question about uh, uh, from uh, Mul Mulligan Riley about uh, is there any organic bearing sediments within the Lake Gears? There was a, there is only one date that I know of. It's from a very very old. Uh, well, this was from the first paper of uh, McDonald and Shields in seventy in sixty seventy. Yeah. I think. American Journal of Science, something like that. Where they had greater than twenty-two thousand because they did not have much uh, material to work with, and I don't think it has ever been redated. So basically, it's a uh, almost there is some uh, life in that lake in some of the species, that's for sure, but there is no organic date. Uh, of, of I know, I don't think shall. No, they're they're extremely scarce within the lake gears sequences. But of course, uh, even though they're proximal, we have not, and we were not inclined. Nobody has, has so far been inclined to look very much into, you know, extract uh, some some uh, organics. Now, with in, in in much of the of these areas were investigated at the time that there was no AMS dating. Hence, uh, unless you found a nice piece of wood or plant or whatever of, of peat uh there is no way that you could uh that, that you could hope to to uh, date those things and uh, i think the radio comet date that michel uh, just mentioned from the chevier valley is a fine example of that it's uh, pretty difficult to um to so essentially we found none and of course we were looking for a stratigraphic break we for instance uh I, I was uh, <clears throat> in the uh, Scott River, Scott, sorry, Scott Road section. I thought that perhaps if I went back there and I could find some organics, uh, that it, perhaps uh, at the at the junction between the two tills. But I've never found. I, I at the time that I, that I first investigated the section, I found none. And uh, when I tried to return to look some more, uh, the section was gone. So. It was a rule. So essentially, no. There's there has been very very few report of any significant uh, uh, datable material 
uh, plant debris and so on from the Geirist interval. And that's the trouble with quaternary geology. Here today, gone tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> yes. Also, yeah, but sometimes, uh, some, sometimes uh, there's nothing to see, and then oh, for about four or five years, there's this fantastic thing, section yeah. just exposed. So, but and, you are, I agree with you. Right? So. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that not everything has been figured out, and there's a lot more to do. Um, so, I think given that we're starting to lose people, I think it's time yeah. for us to conclude yeah. our, our Kirk Bryan field trip. This has been fantastic. And what an experiment for all of us. Yeah. Uh, so thanks to everyone for tolerating um, all the technical issues, but this has been fantastic. And uh, anyway, on behalf of the Quaternary Division, thank you, Mikael, Mikael, for doing this. And uh, thank you, Audrey, for, for all your, your technical help and patience. And, um, I just want to say thanks to everyone. See you in other sessions next week. And uh, thanks and have a great day. Thank right. you very bye much. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you very much. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you again, Audrey. Yes, really, really of course. Great job. Thank you. It's done.